Last week, LPAC published a report concerning the solar and galactic implications of the Japanese earthquake. In that report, Lyndon LaRouche made a forecast in which he stated that we're going to continue to see major earthquakes along the Pacific Ring of Fire. So we have Peter Martinson here from the LPAC basement research team to discuss other forecasts coming from the scientific community. Peter, what can you tell us about these uh, recent forecasts of major tectonic activity along the Ring of Fire? Well, right when we put out the video, there was an avalanche of other forecasts that uh, were coming out about the same time. Uh, some of them are, they're pretty obviously cranks, uh, just responding to the fact that we've had an increased number of large earthquakes just recently. But a couple of them are pretty significant. I'm going to go through two of them uh, just as exemplary. Uh, for example, the first one was uh, just recently a scientist named Alexander Soloviev from the International Institute of Earthquake Prediction Theory and, mathemat and Mathematical Geophysics uh, predicts or forecasts that very soon we could see a large earthquake on the Ch Kamchatka Peninsula coming off of Russia, which uh, if you look at the map, you'll see that that's headed around the Ring of Fire towards Alaska and uh, the northern North America. That's yeah, right north of Japan, right? It's just north of Japan. Now, he cites evidence, uh, seismic evidence, that there are an increasing number of tremors that are getting more and more serious uh, in the Kamchatka region. Now, we also know that, the, that Kamchatka was the site of the explosion of two or three large volcanoes uh, right around the time of the Japanese earthquake. So that place is heating up, and his, uh, his forecast is rather credible. Um, now, the other one is in the United States, which is a man named Jim Birkeland, who's a, a former United States Geological Society geologist, forecasts that between, that this week, from about uh, tonight, the 19th, through about the 26th of March, is a window of seismic opportunity for California, that California is due and threatened with a very large earthquake along the San Andreas Fault, which, uh, now his evidence uh, is rather interesting. He cites two specific pieces of, in, of uh, evidence. First, the relation of the moon and the sun relative to the earth, which tonight is uh, what's called the supermoon phenomenon where it's come to its closest point near the Earth at the same time that it's a full moon, so at opposition to the sun. So the tidal changes in the Earth, uh, he says, uh, will, can have the potential of destabilizing the area around the earthquake. His other uh, point of evidence, which is also very interesting, uh, regards the strange behavior of animals. And he says, for example, very recently uh, there have been a couple of uh, so-called fish kills where a large number of dead fish wash up on beaches uh, in California and also Mexico very recently. Now on, on the moon, what is it that, how, how is it that the, the moon is affecting the Earth? Why would it be a hypothesis that the, the moon could actually have a tectonic effect on the Earth? Well, the, the moon is related, anybody who lives on the coast knows this, that you have two high tides and two low tides every single day. So this, the water is going up and going down twice a day. And the going up and going down is always associated with the moon going overhead. So one time, so the moon will go overhead and you have a high tide which follows it. Um, 12 hours after that, you'll have another high tide. Um, now, the full uh, understanding of how that works is not yet understood again. But when the moon is full, we tend to have larger tides. The tides go up further and they go down further. When the moon is at the closest point in its orbit, because it's an elliptical orbit, when it's at perigee, you also tend to have uh, the largest tides of the month. Now, uh, tonight, both of those events are occurring at the same time. Not only is the moon at its perigee, but it's also a full moon. So you have the opposition to the sun. So the sun is also affecting these tides. Now, the issue that people don't uh, know that much about is that the tides don't just affect the water, but they also affect the crust of the earth, that the crust also goes up and down 
uh, you know, very small amounts on the order of inches every day, twice a day, along with the tides. So the moon is creating a type of pulling effect on the earth, not only affecting the water, but you're saying the land as well? Apparently, yeah. There's a response uh, by the land to the position of the moon, and it's more uh, pronounced when you have these, uh, this conjunction of an opposition between the moon and the sun and the closest point of the moon to the earth. And so the, the theory of Birkeland is that when the, uh, when the crust is being deformed by, that, by those types of stresses, you have the potential of releasing an immense amount of uh, tension that's been built up along a fault line, which is exactly the condition we have uh, along the San Andreas Fault in California. Geologists across the world agree that that fault is, has been ready to go for decades. Now, the other aspect of his forecast is uh, regards these animal, animal reactions, which are a little bit, uh, they're pretty interesting. He cites a couple of recent uh, so-called mass deaths of fish that have washed up on the shores around um, in Mexico and also Southern California. Um, they're also, he also looks at, so mass deaths of fish, he says that his so-called forecasts of earthquakes also include beaching of whales, um, things like wild animals coming into town, uh, flocks of birds that migrate strangely, all of which he attributes to the fact that near the time of an earthquake, which we talked about in the last show, near the time of an earthquake you have magnetical, you have anomalies in the geomagnetic field, hmm. and all of these animals use the magnetic field to migrate. Whales do, fish apparently, like tuna and salmon, have the ability to uh, navigate according to the magnetic field. Birds, same this, thing. This is the same phenomenon of magnetoreception that your research team discussed in the uh, report that you recently put out on this website called the Extended Sensorium. One of the papers detailed this phenomenon in pigeons, uh, which was the reason why homing pigeons were used in World War II. Uh, in various wars because of their ability to navigate their way home no matter where on the planet they were. How does, maybe you could elaborate on how that works and why? Uh, well, yeah, in the sensorium report we uh, go through, this is why, this is one of the reasons why we take these types of forecasts very seriously. So what we go through in the sensorium report is that um, all the organisms on the planet, including plants to some extent, and including humans, are very sensitive to uh, domains of cosmic radiation that are outside of the usual visual senses, the usual uh, hearing senses, what we typically call the five, the so-called five senses. And what we show in the uh, report, the five senses are kind of a, it's kind of a hoax to say that there are only five senses, that there are a lot more, like the magnetoreception. Uh, it's, there are some indications that human beings respond to magnets, um, the magnetic field. There's very clear, obvious uh, evidence that birds use the magnetic field to navigate. And the geomagnetic field uh, on our scales is not a very strong force. It's not a very strong, like if anybody's used a magnetic compass, you see that it takes a while for the compass to settle down. And any you know, electronic device that's near the compass is going to throw that thing out of whack. So the magnetic field is uh, less strong than that. Yet these organisms, these birds, whales, fish, can sense direction relative to things like the magnetic field. And what we find is that uh, the organisms are so sensitive to these, uh, not just magnetic fields, but also ultraviolet radiation, infrared radiation, um, cosmic rays, all domains of cosmic radiation organisms respond to no matter how weak those fields are, going all the way down to like micro Teslas, tiny, tiny, uh, tiny, tiny uh, intensities. So we would expect that when you have a period near an earthquake which exhibits these uh, long wave changes in the magnetic field, the geomagnetic field, that animals would respond to that even though the changes are very, very slight. Now, the other aspect that he points out, which is kind of, it's kind of funny, but it's also something that you would imagine you'd look for. Uh, we referenced before that dogs and cats can sometimes forecast earthquakes. 
well, this gentleman in California watches the, uh, the homeless animal shelters to look at how many more dogs and how many more cats come in uh, at different times of the month. And apparently, just recently, uh, there's been a spike around Southern California of stray dogs and cats who have, for some reason or other, freaked out and left their owners, hmm. so, possibly for survival. So people should be assured that their pets aren't just leaving them for personal problems that they may have with their owners. Right. They don't hate the owners. Don't panic. You know, uh, your cats and dogs still love you. They're at the pound, but they just got a little freaked out about the fact that an earthquake might hit. Oh, good soon. news. Your animals still love you, but you may have an earthquake. <laughs> right, exactly. So follow your pets. <laughs> now, there's various reports on the internet of people claiming to predict earthquakes. What is it about these two forecasts that you uh, chose to refer to that make them particularly credible? Well, the reason we're interested in the earthquake is that, um, and the series of earthquakes in general, is that they present a problem for humanity because we don't understand what the relationships are, but we know that there are other relationships. And these gentlemen do point at the specific types of relationships that, uh, that we would expect. Now, uh, there's a pretty big block on the ability of scientists to forecast and publish their forecasts of earthquakes because people are afraid, well, it's going to panic people, you know, you're going to cause mass panic and it's going to be horrible. People are going to uh, start to say you're crying wolf and they won't listen to you anymore. But science is, science as a method of thinking is the ability to forecast future conditions in the universe which includes being able to forecast at least windows that certain things are coincident, like earthquakes, solar activity, the moon, and things like that. Well, it seems you would also need a relationship to the government in, so that the government can be able to prepare people. Exactly. As opposed to just having a lone scientist make a prediction, cause a panic, you would have a, a cooperation and have a, a public announcement and a procedure and preparation for these types of events. Right. For example, it would make sense right now for the uh, U.S. government to uh, begin preparing for something like a gigantic earthquake in California, uh, especially knowing all the conditions that are, you know, essentially lining up right now. The problem is that we have President Obama in office, and uh, hopefully, you know, there are some reports that there's uh, an increased internship in mental hospitals around the times of earthquakes. So this would probably be the perfect opportunity to invoke the 25th Amendment and put an insane Obama safely away as a victim of earthquake insanity. Or he might just think it was the popular thing to do and exactly go along with it. <laughs> and everybody there will like him, so that's fine. We should do it. But the other aspect of, the, of this is that, yes, yeah, science is... Uh, it is something that should be uh, predictable. We don't understand what's causing the earthquakes. We don't understand what exactly the relationship is. But we do see very clear correlations. For example, just uh, uh, I think it was yesterday, there was another very large solar flare. The sun is going into a solar maximum period, and it'll be headed into that maximum. It's not at its most active uh, point yet. It'll reach that, uh, we think, in 2013. But even that's somewhat debatable because the sun just went through uh, a cycle that was two years longer than every other solar cycle that we've seen before. So things are changing with the sun. But then we also have what we've referenced before in some other videos, um, a 62 million year cycle, give or take a couple million years, cycle of not just biodiversity, but also the motion of the solar system through the galaxy, which is also related to a 62 million year cycle of increase and decreased tectonic activity, which is represented by things like volcanism. Would you say we're at some type of anomalous point within that cycle now? Uh, we think so, but again, this requires a lot more investigation in exactly this area. For example, you know, we could say 65 million years ago was the great extinction of the dinosaurs. So three million years ago, we were at the other potential great extinction and transformation point. So we probably are at a very 
tumultuous point in the lifespan of our solar system, which also seems to coincide with the rise and domination of uh, creative human beings, which brings another uh, issue to play, which is that all the other organisms in the past have gone extinct. That's clear. Human beings are the only species on the planet in history that have the capability of preventing themselves from going extinct by understanding just these types of phenomena that uh, these two gentlemen are referring to. We can creatively understand what would cause the destruction of human civilization and turn the tables on that, which we're right at a point where we need to do that. Well, you could say that the, the human mind is the same type of weak force that you've been discussing in these phenomena. The magnetic field is not such a particularly strong force, but animals can detect it. Mm -hmm. the, it causes very powerful effects, even though the force itself may not seem very strong. seems that the human mind is a similar type of force. Mm -hmm. That while, while we're not physically the strongest, the biggest, the fastest, those with all of the super senses, we have quite the capability to move mountains and to change the face of the earth. Right. Like for, you know, we have two examples. One is that we do have a mass strike which is breaking out right now, which, uh, you know, we had various reports on the website. But with the mass strike, you have a, another example of a breakout of a cosmic radiation event, where it's not that some person in uh, Libya or some person in uh, Egypt, you know, somehow got, you know, a forceful message to somebody in Wisconsin to, you know, begin uh, the protests. But there was a, essentially a simultaneous breakout around the planet of this mass strike phenomenon. Um, it wasn't Twitter. There's something in the spirit of the times that is moving people. Right, exactly. And then another example of this is uh, our ability to make discoveries of how things like the biosphere function and then uh, inject, craft the, craft the land and the biosphere in order to make it do things that we want it to do. For example, with the North American Water and Power Alliance uh, project, where we have the plans, the know-how, we're contacting the engineers and so forth uh, to begin putting into place the types of dams and reservoirs and uh, digging out you know, deep tunnels and things like that to bring the hundreds of millions of acre feet of fresh water down into the dry parts of the United States, which, by the way, might have very important consequences in terms of seismic activity on the Earth. And I'll just say one thing that this uh, Russian scientist says, uh, Soloviev, he makes the point that we're seeing small tremors right now in Kamchatka. He says that could be leading up to one violent release of whatever the tension is that's been building up there, which would be a giant earthquake. Or it could continue these micro tremors to the point that things settle down and the tension gets dissipated over a long period of time. We know that when we set up uh, you know, large reservoirs of water, we create the conditions for increased seismic activities. You tend to have earthquakes around newly created deep reservoirs of water. Now if we create giant reservoirs of water in places like Alaska or along the, uh, the Rocky Mountain Trench, we're going to be putting water in areas that, are, that tend to be more seismically active. By doing things like adjusting the reservoirs, we might be able to let out some of the steam of some of these earthquakes and actually control the power of some of these earthquakes. It seems that the Nawapa project itself would be a science driver for looking into this seismic activity. Exactly. That's, uh, this is going to be a boon for uh, all sciences that deal with uh, not just the internal workings of the Earth, but the relation be between the Earth and the rest of the uh, solar system domain.